I've done 22 AI engineer interviews and I've noted some of the most important concepts that you need to understand to get a job as an AI engineer. Because the Gen AI field is so new, if you master these concepts, I guarantee that you will impress your interviewer and maximize your chances of landing an AI engineer job offer. I'm a self-taught senior AI engineer and I'm here to help you how to break into and grow in this ever-changing field. I think it's important to note that a lot of AI engineer roles are low-key full-stack roles or at least back-end roles on top of some AI stuff. So make sure you're brushed up on your full stack and your back end because you might still get some questions about like, oh, explain the JavaScript event loop, which I seem to fail every time. I don't know why, like I still haven't learned it. I just can never seem to explain it. So make sure you're prepared for those questions as well. Also some other notes, some of these questions won't really be specific to Gen AI. They can be questions about Python or other program related questions. They're just very commonly asked in AI engineering job interviews. Also, most of these are questions that I've gotten, but some of them are not. They're more concepts that I've used to kind of highlight my knowledge and impress the interviewers. So I'm kind of reframing those as questions so that you can learn those concepts as well. So just make sure you understand the actual concepts behind each question and not just memorize the answer. So let's get started. First of all, can you describe the difference between Gen AI and traditional programming in the context of solving a real world problem? So traditional programming is rule based and explicit. You can kind of expect what inputs to get and what outputs you are looking for. The program does exactly what you need and nothing more. And the logic is hard coded essentially. So this approach is great for tasks with well-defined rules. Generative AI is data driven and probabilistic. Instead of writing a bunch of rules, you provide a model with an insane amount of data and the model learns the patterns and relationships in that data and uses that to generate new content. So the logic here is learned, not coded, is a big differentiator. And this is more suited for creative or more ambiguous tasks where you don't really have a defined set of rules, like summarizing a document or writing an email. If you have a predictable set of inputs and outputs, then traditional programming is still the way to go. A lot of AI startups right now, they just seem to plaster on AI for no reason at all. When, If you actually look at what they're doing, it can be done without AI. They're just, I guess, trying to raise VC money. This is dumb. This can maybe help you build a solution faster, but the trade-off is that you'll incur a lot of unnecessary expenses for using the LLM APIs, and it can cause a lot of unpredictable exceptions in your application and lead to more bugs. So. Consider when that trade-off makes sense. How would you approach designing a scalable and reliable automation workflow? What considerations would you take into account for error handling, monitoring, and debugging? So a very important principle in Gen AI is modularity. So break down the workflow into smaller reusable components. Whenever you're trying to optimize a Gen AI system, one of the first things you should look at is trying to split an LLM call into multiple calls like splitting the prompt, because the principle is that each node in a system should have one instruction, really. The more specific the instruction, the better. And that's why it's better to have multiple nodes doing different things than one master node doing everything. This makes the system easier to scale and debug. So for example, have a separate model for data ingestion, one for cleaning, and another for output. Now, since you have all these different components, it's important to decouple them. And this is where you can use task queues like RabbitMQ or Kafka. So instead of one component directly calling another, it simply sends a message to a task queue. And this allows different components to operate at their own pace without waiting for each other, which is crucial for scalability. Also related to what I said about modularity is when you have different components, see when you can implement asynchronous programming to make sure things are happening concurrently. One of the biggest issues of Gen AI is latency. Asynchronous programming is a way to prevent that. Describe a time you had to optimize an existing process or workflow for efficiency or scalability. So to start these questions, you want to give background on the project and your task, and also how you found out what you needed to optimize or that, that you even needed to optimize in the first place. So was it a customer that was complaining about high latency or were you running a benchmark? The first step in your process is Always run a benchmark so you know the baseline. 
And then you try to find the bottleneck. So maybe you look at inefficient code, maybe like nested for loops. A common cause of latency in Gen AI is the LLM calls themselves. So consider benchmarking each LLM call, see how long they're taking. Consider breaking down the LLM calls into separate calls. For example, you might have a prompt that takes a couple of notes uh, in English and it generates a blog post in Portuguese. That can be split into one call that generates the actual blog post in English. And then you can use maybe a smaller, faster model to translate into Portuguese. This will save you on API costs and minimize latency, which are probably the two biggest problems you'll face when building Gen AI systems. And once you're done talking about your solution, make sure to mention the results. What was the difference in the latency, et cetera? What was the reception for the customers? Were the stakeholders happy with the additional cost savings? Make sure to mention this. If you're finding this video helpful so far, make sure to give me a like. It helps me make videos more helpful to you. What is an AI agent and what is its role in a broader system? An AI agent is an autonomous goal-oriented system that uses a large language model as its brain. It's usually giving access to a bunch of different tools and it can reason, plan, and use these tools in the order it best seems fit to achieve a complex goal. Uh, another key feature of AI agents is the ability to remember past conversations and use that as context when trying to achieve the next goal. Now, everyone's talking about AI agents right now, like they're the cure for cancer. In reality though, is you can get away a lot with a predefined workflow with LLM calls. There's a lot of cases where you don't actually need an agent and they introduce a lot of additional complexity. I think this is a very important hot take to bring up in your interviews. I surely do it and people seem impressed by it because people in tech tend to have shiny object syndrome where something new gets released and then everyone wants to use it everywhere. But if you show that you understand the pitfalls of using AI agents, then it can really help you in your interviews. And if you'd like to learn more about that, I actually made a video about it, which you can check out here. So how do you ensure the outputs from large language models are consistent and accurate, especially when dealing with complex multi-step workflows? One thing to mention here is decomposition or modularity. I've already talked about breaking things down into smaller components that are more specified. You can also enforce structured output, for example, in the OpenAI Python library. You can provide a schema with the desired output that you want. And it's actually very useful because you won't really need to specify in your prompt, hey, I want this in a JSON object that looks like this. Uh, it will kind of just take care of it for you. And in general, I'd recommend using a framework like Langchain or Langgraph. This is not what's recommended by Anthropic. Uh, they want you to start by implementing everything yourself. I think there's pros to that too, but I do think these frameworks do a lot of heavy lifting and they've certainly helped me work and learn a lot faster. The most important technique for ensuring accuracy is RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. So supplying data from a knowledge base is kind of a source of truth. And by doing this, you ensure that the outputs are actually based on factual data rather than the model's training data. And when using RAG, you should also set it up in a way that the LLM is referencing the sources for every claim it's making so that you as a human reviewer can actually make sure that the output you're getting is backed up by factual data. This builds trust and makes the system a lot more reliable. And I think a kind of bonus point to really impress the interviewer here is talking about guardrails. Putting up guardrails that will filter out any personal data, both in the input and the output stages, harmful or malicious data. For example, if you have an application that generates code that can be arbitrarily executed, uh, as in the case of my Condo GPT project, where you can actually prompt it to generate a PDF report, what happens is it generates the Python code to generate that report, and then that Python code is executed by the system. This means that there's a possibility of a user maliciously prompting the system to generate some malicious Python code. So I put up a guardrail there that filters out for any of the common you know, packages that could uh, harm the system, essentially. That's an example of a guardrail. And uh, highlighting this will really show that you understand not just how to build Gen AI systems, but how to make them secure which is another big problem in Gen AI. And lastly, I'd say you should have a golden data set with inputs and outputs, like common user queries and then the answer to those queries so that when you run similar queries, either as a human reviewer or as a, an automated reviewing process, you can kind of compare 
how similar the output is to the output in the golden data set. This is also useful for when you change the system or change the prompt or anything. You can kind of rerun these tests against the golden data set to see how much you're deviating from it. Next up, this isn't really a question, but these are concepts that you can be expected to know. It's basically concurrency and parallelism in Python and also the global interpreter lock. These are a bit more advanced Python concepts and I really recommend you understand that at least if the job you're applying for is using Python. I actually made a video about these uh, more advanced Python concepts and I do explain GIL concurrency and parallelism there. So make sure to check it out here if you'd like to learn more. It's all timestamped so you can just go to those three concepts and I explain it there. So when and how would you implement large language model guardrail? Guardrails are important when you need to ensure that the output is safe, reliant, and consistent. You can implement this in the input stage, such as filtering out personal identifiable information, like names, addresses, credit card numbers, etc. You can also check for various prompt injection techniques and filter those out. You can also use a separate dedicated model that can help detect um, malicious or hateful content from the prompt and sanitize that prompt or even reject it. On the output level, you can validate the format, making sure you have JSON data when you want JSON data. And if your response is supposed to be factual, you can cross-reference that with your knowledge base. So if it cites a source that doesn't exist or is incorrect, then you should flag this as a hallucination, which you can later use to improve the model. So you should implement guardrails when there's a risk that the LLM would generate unsafe content, such as harmful, toxic, illegal material. This is to protect both the user and the company. Or when there's a chance of hallucination or providing inaccurate information. This is useful in like financial and medical applications, for example. And to that end, also when there's a chance of leaking personal information, uh, definitely important in the medical space, making sure patient data isn't accessed by people it's, that are not supposed to access it. Okay. What is RLHF and why is it important? So reinforcement learning from human feedback is a training method that aligns a language model's behavior to align their behavior with human values, making them more reliable and safe. And it's a three-step process. There's supervised fine-tuning where an initial language model is trained on a small, high-quality data set of human-written demonstrations. And this teaches the model basic conversational behavior. And then you train a separate, smaller model to predict human preferences. So humans are shown several different responses to a single prompt and rank them from best to worst. This new reward model learns to mimic these rankings, effectively becoming a human preference predictor. And then the main language model is fine-tuned using reinforcement learning. Here, the reward model that we just constructed acts as a critic, giving the reward or a penalty based on the quality of its generated response. The LLM learns to generate answers that maximize its reward, pushing it toward outputs that the reward model predicts a human would prefer. RLHF is vital because it teaches language models to be helpful, honest, and harmless, going a step beyond just predicting the next word. And this is the key for making models work in real life applications by reducing bias and harmful content. Okay, here's a scenario. So you're making a system that processes huge PDF reports. This is usually where you chunk the document because it's so big. How would you handle the problem of not keeping an entire report's context when splitting a document for a chatbot? For example, let's say you have a financial report of a property. On the first page, it says that all amounts are listed in thousands of dollars, which means if you're on the second page and it says 35, that's $35,000, not $35. But if you chunk it page by page, the LLM will think it actually means $35. So how do you solve this very common problem? There's a number of different ways to achieve it. The first one is through metadata. So you can do one pass where you go through the entire document and kind of look for metadata, like data that's applicable throughout the entire document. And then with each chunk, you store that metadata in there as well. Also, what you can do is you can summarize each chunk using another model. And then let's say your user asks for something on page two 
it will first go through all the summarized chunks to find any, any relevant information to answer the question. It will use that chunk. Both of these are kind of similar. What metrics do you consider when benchmarking and evaluating LLM performance? So first one is relevance, especially in RAG systems where a lot of the data provided is factual from a database. So does they measure how well the output addresses the user's input and context? making sure the retrieved context and the output are both relevant to the user's query, and that the final answer uses that context appropriately. Also, a time to first token. This is a critical latency metric, and it's measuring the time it takes for the application to generate the first part of the response. As you probably know, when you're, you send in your prompt, you're just waiting for it to start typing right so you know it's cooking. Getting there to that first token is very important. And if you have a high time to first token, you also have a high bounce rate from your website and your web app because people are very impatient nowadays. So this is super important for a good user experience and for example, chatbots. Another is um, hallucination rate. So these are things you might have to flag with a human reviewer, basically just counting out of all the prompts you send, how many result in hallucinated outputs. Cost is an important metric, you know, how much is each LLM call using? Maybe compare that to the amount of tokens sent with each call as well. It would be quite interesting to look at. I get this general question asked a lot. Describe a challenging prompt engineering problem that you solve. I can't really give you an answer here. I mean, I do sort of give an answer in um, this video where I talk about the project I made to get my first day engineer job. But the best way to answer this question is to actually have a project and journal you know, your frustrations, what went wrong, how you optimized it yourself, because this is an open-ended question. They're not looking for you to have solutions here. They can't just looking at, hmm, has this person faced the same challenges that we do currently in the company? What's this person's problem solving skills like? But basically you can talk about, you know, multi-shot prompting where you provide more examples and the actual prompts to help guarantee a better outcome, a more pre predictable outcome. Setting persona and tone of the prompt is very important as well. Also providing context and constraints and make sure that, you know, whatever solution you describe to them, that you also talk about the results. That's something that's very often overlooked. And there you go. There's all the questions I'm going to go through today, but I do have more questions from my notes with interviewing. So if you like more interview questions like this, let me know and I'll consider making that into a sequel, I guess. A lot of the concepts you need to learn are kind of related to optimizing Gen AI systems. And that is something I talk a lot about in this video about creating AI agents. So make sure to watch it. A lot of that is backed up by actual articles from Anthropic. So it's pretty good stuff. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later.